logarithmic uh, vertex operator algebras. And uh, first of all, uh, I would say that uh, I gave a talk uh, about a week ago in the KITP uh, workshop. So this talk will be partially overlapping with that talk, although I don't see anyone uh, who was also uh, present at the talk, maybe I'm mistaken. But um, so, um, but it will be, I'll make it as complimentary as possible, but um, the first 15 minutes at least will be uh, overlapping. Okay, so the, um, so yeah, so um, now the, well, okay. I will have to change slides like this, but I think we'll survive. Okay, so the story I'm telling uh, today is the relation between uh, three manifold invariant and uh, quantum module forms and logarithmic uh, vertex algebras. Um, so as such, it's a story connecting many uh, different topics, like uh, the study of quantum module forms uh, is closer to the study of number theory, and uh, the definition of uh, the three manifolds invariant will have a physical origin, and uh, um, of course, uh, the study of uh, or the definition of such uh, uh, three manifolds invariant is interesting for yeah the study of the topology of three manifolds. And uh, finally, um, the uh, VOA, from the VOA point of view, um, it's, um, it's interesting to study this problem from the representation and uh, uh, theory point of view. Okay, so, um, and as we go through the talk, I'll talk more about this, uh, these uh, different relations and uh, motivations. And it's based on uh, some papers and some work in progress with this group of wonderful collaborators. So I'll start by giving the background. So what are these uh, three manifold invariants? Okay, first of all, why would we want to have a three manifold invariants since we already know there are some topological invariants that we all know and love, namely uh, the so-called uh, witten rushdikin to arrive invariants of a three manifold. So uh, physically speaking, they're uh, simply the, the uh, transcendence partition function that's on living on the three manifolds. Okay, and uh, without, um, well, till the end of the talk, I'll be talking about the SU2 transcendence, okay? And we all know that such uh, WRT invariants are defined, are functions defined on the integers. And this integer will be the level of the SU2 transcendence. And the question, a natural question, an important question is, okay, can we go, can we have an invariance that defined on the continuous domain, for instance, on the upper half plane or inside the unit desk, and then, and then and in, in a way that to have this invariance generalizing or extending the, the known uh, WRT invariance. Well, we know that such Q-series invariants, uh, they are very important in the study of knots, for instance. And then moreover, given such a Q-series invariants, you can further, you can go ahead and categorify, okay? Uh, and interpret this, Q, this coefficients of the Q-series in terms of some, some underlying vector spaces. Right, so um, now an idea, to define such a Q series is to have a Q series such that when you take the radial limit, namely you approach, yeah, you approach uh, the boundary of a unit circle from within the unit circle, such that it, you know the the limit goes to a case root of unity where k is again the level of the transcendence, such that you have a, such a Q series such that when you take the radial limit, it recovers the WRT invariant evaluated at a level k for you. So that is the you know. Uh, a key idea of defining such a Q series invariance for three manifolds. Okay, and this idea is not new, okay? Before their work uh, starting with uh, Lawrence Zagier 
and Hikami, and now we, uh, and a lot of work by Habiro defining the so-called universal WRT. But what you could see immediately is that this relation to WRT is not sufficient actually to in order to fix the Q series. Well, to see that, well, you can just add to this Q series any cus form, and it's not going to change the radial limit of, uh, and 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 so um, this does not define for you a well-defined Q series as we know it. So an idea, another idea of why such a Q-series uh, invariant should exist comes from uh, M-theory. So you take a 60 uh, M5 frame theory. Well, as we all know, it's a 2 comma 0 theory and, 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 and it's labeled by A or D or E. And then you compatify it now on the three-dimensional, uh, on the closed three manifold. What you're left with is a three-dimensional uh, supersymmetric quantum field theory. Well, we make it supersymmetric. And now with this uh, 3D quantum field theory, okay, you can uh, define, okay, you can put it on the space-time that's a cigar times time. And then uh, with a specific uh, boundary condition that preserves super supersymmetry, you can define the so-called half index. And this half index counting the BPS states of this theory then will be uh, a, a Q series. Well, it could be an infinite Q series in general with integer coefficients. Okay, and that's what we call the Z hat. While well, this B label, well, later there will sometimes be A, <laughs> either A or B, um, will be uh, describing the choice of the boundary condition. Okay. All right, so um, that's a, a physical definition if you want, um, but how about a mathematical uh, definition that you can actually uh, compute things with? Um, so um, this definition is given in this uh, paper in 2017 uh, for plump manifolds. So what are plump manifolds? Oh, sorry, well, as, uh, excuse uh -huh. me, Sandra. could I ask a brief question about the physical definition? Yeah. Um, so why does this become topological? Well, because you do some, uh, you do some, uh, you, you do the necessary twist on this theory. Ah, so there's a twist. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So you, you do, you compactify on the cigar, well, it's not compactify, but you, you take the cigar cross RT and yeah. then you, you take a twi topological twist using the supersymmetry. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so please interrupt me anytime if there's questions, especially we have such a, you know, intimate audience. And it's great, you know, set up for asking questions. Um, all right, so thanks for the question. So um, what are these plot manifolds? Well, the as well, uh, the data defining a plot manifold is a weighted graph. It's called plumbing graph in this context. And here we will be uh, restricting to uh, to graphs that are trees, so there is no loops. So. Uh, the weighted graph means that associated to each vertex, you also uh, give you, you also uh, there is also an integer. It could be positive, it could be negative integer associated to each vertex, and uh, the same data can be represented by uh, the adjacency matrix. Then this adjacency matrix uh, you, is defined in the following way. So you have one dimension for each, uh, one entry for each uh, uh, vertex, and then you put on the diagonal the corresponding weights of the vertices. And then you put the one at the off diagonal if the corresponding two vertices are connected by an edge. So the same, the same data can be used to construct a, a plumped three manifolds. Okay, uh, what you what you do is okay. You can define a disk bundle over S two with Euler characteristic given by given by the a uh, the weights, and then you glue them together. Okay, 
in the event that the two vertices are uh, connected by an edge. In this way, you get, uh, you obtain a four manifolds and the boundary of this is a closed manifold, okay? In particular, if you just have one center edge, one center vertex and many edges emanating from it, then you get a cipher manifold. Okay, so B1 is zero for such in this situation, and the H1 will just be given by the co kernel of this adjacency matrix. So, um, as I said, as I mentioned, they uh, contain all the cipher manifolds. All the cipher manifolds can be obtained in this way, but not all the closed manifolds can be obtained in this way. So we will be restricting to this class of three manifolds in the context of this talk. So uh, we see that the H1 just is just given by the co-kernel, and then they play, and this set plays an important role in defining the Q-series invariants. Uh, one reason to think about it is, is one, yeah, one interpretation is that this set, well, up to some wild group action, the wild group here is Z2, uh, the wild group of SU2. They, uh, they're the, also the same set labeling the abelian flag connections on the uh, plump manifolds. So uh, remember that uh, the flag connection is called a billion flag connection if it has a non-trivial uh, stabilizer group. Okay, so, uh, and this also labels the boundary conditions of the TQFT. Well, this equivalence is not completely, is not immediately manifest, but uh, this is uh, true. Okay, alternatively, this also labels the spin C structures that you can put on this plump manifold. And this is uh, also another way to think about this. Okay, now so, coming to, uh, yeah. Sorry, Miranda, could I ask? So when you said the abelian flat connections, this is the dual of that H1, right? Uh, that's right, exactly. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So they're equivalent as a as as a set, but indeed we was they are dual, and we will see the 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 consequence of that soon. But what did you mean by the boundary condition that I didn't quite understand? Okay, so um, the boundary condition mean, meaning like if I had because this we I put this on cigar. Right. times and times, so there is a boundary at the end of the cigar, and I need to specify the boundary condition oh, here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one way to see uh, is that uh, this is uh, where like uh, M M massless M2 brains and NTN2 brain pair um, will be I'm given sorry. by this H1. Uh -huh. I'm still a little bit confused because uh, so that cigar, has nothing to do with M3, right? Cigar is what you're... Uh, yeah, yeah, right. But the, but, the, but the QFT itself depends on M3. And hence, the boundary con possible boundary conditions depends on M3. Oh, I see. OK, so, uh-huh. OK, I, see, I, see. I think I understand. OK, carry on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And could, so, could you explain? Why you only restrict to abelian flat connections, not, not all? Oh connections. yeah, that's that's that is um, a, well a cool fact, and that's what I meant. Like it's not completely manifest that uh, abelian connections should be the sets that's um, that's that 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 they're labeling these boundary conditions here. Um, so I would say that, you know, it just turns out to be the same set, but one way to think about these boundary conditions, well, what I find the easiest way to understand is in terms of like, you want to have massless M2 and anti-M2, M2 brain pair, and that's given by the, this torsion part of the H1. But indeed- How, how does this work in, in higher rank? If you have- uh, group not SL2, but something else? Right, so um, I'll, I'll show you in the end of the talk. Well, 
in the last part of the talk, how this works in higher rank. Okay. Sorry, if I could just ask once more, <laughs> sorry, I, I, this is going to be a no very problem. elementary question, but I think I was sort of confusing the point of view earlier. So first you, uh, you plugged in M3 into one side of the 60 theory, right? And then yeah. you're viewing that as determining what's uh, therefore a 3D theory, right? And then you're yeah. evaluating it that under cigar cross uh, uh, yeah. time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, um, then I, yeah, and, and you're saying the boundary conditions of the theory uh, yeah. that you're evaluating on the cigar cross time is determined by the H1, right? Yeah. Okay, so okay. I think I understand that point. But now I, I'm, I'm somewhat even more confused than before because okay. uh, the 60 okay. theory was a, a super conformal field theory, right? Mm -hmm. Then when you're plugging in M3, you don't need a conformal structure on M3. Uh, I don't think so. No, we don't. I see. Uh -huh. Or have has one twisted that already somehow? Though? Well, I think one twists the uh, resulting three D theory. I see, but you don't need that conformal structure on M three itself. Uh huh. I see. But in any case, um, mm -hmm. you, if you want, you can regard that as just inspirations and just work with this definition on this slide. Because actually, for the rest of the talk, all that matters is this, <laughs> this definition. If you don't ask where this definition no, should come from. <laughs> I guess when I heard this, the talk about these kind of things before, the M3 is tended to have a natural conformal structure, you know, so, but I don't know, maybe that's a, a point of view I can take, but anyways, carry on, yeah, I'm just being stupid. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, that's, uh, if you want, sort of the motivation of why we expect uh, 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 three manifold invariants labeled by this uh, set that's just given by the Koch kernel. So now I give you the actual definition. Um, so this definition goes as follows. Well, for um, for a plum manifold, which mo moreover satisfies a sep uh, an additional uh, property. Namely, that the adjacency matrix M should uh, define a negative definite uh, space. Then, for a given element of the co kernel, we can define the theta function. That's just the usual theta function. But uh, here you can already see why we need a negative def definiteness for the adjacency matrix. We need that such that this theta is uh, well defined, is convergent inside a unit disk. Here, Q as usual is e to the two pi i tau. Okay. So then, this theta function, given this condition, is something that lives on the opera plane. So given the theta function, uh, you dress it up with an additional factor. And this factor, you have one such factor for each vertex. It's just uh, z, z minus one over z to some degree, okay, to some power. And this power is given by two minus the degree of the vertex. Okay, and then you take uh, a contour integral which has the effect of picking out the z independent uh, terms in this in this thing in the parentheses, and that will become uh, your Q series invariance. Okay, so uh, I promise that this invariance should have something to do with the WRT, and it involves taking a radial limit. But wait a second, because here we actually get naturally a set of uh, Q ser series invariants for a given manifold, not just one. So we have an additional uh, label given by the element of co kernel, so we should sum over them in some appropriate way. So, okay, for the plump manifolds, this following relation is actually proven. 
So the WRT at level K is given here some prefactor. And then, uh, well, for each element A and B, so here we get, we have the uh, uh, prefactor given by uh, the transcendence, uh, transcendence number of, of the corresponding abelian flat connection. And here, as, uh, as you pointed out earlier, well, it's actually the dual space. So you need a matrix to, you know, perform this, if you want, change of basis. Then you sum over them. And then you take the limit of tau. Tau is something living in the upper half plane now to one over k. So that is the structure of the relation. So it's a very rich structure because, uh, well, for instance, if you take the large Q K limit and you should be able to recover this trans series expansion. Now the sum should be over all, every single SU2 flat connection, not just the abelian one. Okay, so uh, that you can reproduce uh, from the properties of the Z hat invariant that I will describe shortly. And then, well, also you can read off the Osuke series, namely the perturbative part, okay, of these uh, things, also from the properties of the Z hat invariants. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Miranda, uh -huh. I think yeah. you said this earlier, but is H is this H1 torsion? Is that what you said? Yeah, this H1 in our uh, case where in the rest of the talk, I will limit to like uh, three graphs and this H1 will be torsion, yes. I see, okay, so that, so, yeah. but then why is the sum over all SU2 flat connections a sum rather than an integral or something? Sorry? What, the, the then you said that this, uh, your, uh, give a trans there's a trans series expansion. Yeah, 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 is, but yeah. The sum over all SU2 flat connections, but is that also a discrete set somehow? Yeah, yeah, no, all in equivalent SU2 flat, con yeah. It becomes discrete in this case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so actually, there is a beautiful story uh, I won't uh, have the chance to talk about today. Um, just um, how this trend series expansion is, uh, is, yeah, is, is actually beautifully sort of organized in the quantum modular form property of this uh, Q series invariants. And why, how from that point of view, you can see like, although you're only sum, summing over here, uh, abelian flat connections, but you naturally get out all the SU2 flat connections. And you can also see moreover the, the complex flat connections hidden somewhere. But that's another story uh, <laughs> that I'm afraid I won't have time to cover today. So, uh, that's my introduction on what the Q series invariants uh, are. And the topic of the talk, well, one of the topics is the conjecture that uh, these uh, Q series invariants are quantum modular forms of some kind. Okay. And uh, I'll show you what, <laughs> quant what well, I'll tell you what quantum modular forms are and what, what I mean by of some sort. But before a little commercial time is that uh, in, some case, in, in some sense, I mean, quantum modularity just is, works somewhat like modularity. I mean, before we know, like if you know something is a modular form, then it helps you to determine the function completely if you are just given the first few terms and so on. And the same thing act actually also happens here. And as I was alluding to in the relation to Simons and to WRT and uh, trans series and all that, uh, that it actually needs to nice new ways of retrieving topological information on the three manifolds. And of course, the hope is that it tells us something important about uh, the physical theories that's behind all this. So uh, I should also say that uh, 
the relation uh, between quantum modular form and a three manifold invariance actually had been uh, sort of investigated in the in the in the context of knots, on the, in particular the Kashaev invariance of knots. And um, so I also encourage you to look at the past and ongoing work that's uh, cited here. Okay, so now I'm ready to tell you what uh, quantum modular forms are. So uh, in particular, the quantum modular form that we will encounter, they are functions defined on the rationals. So what's so modular about the rationals? I mean, usually if you think about modular forms, you think about the upper half plane, but that's true, but uh, we all know that we also know that upper half plane has natural boundary that's on the rationals and the point at I infinity. Moreover, SO2Z group, the modular group, acts transitively on them. Okay, here you can see uh, just to set up notation, I'll uh, write an SO2Z uh, elements in this way. And then we all know how it acts on the upper plane. So it acts like this on the cusps. Okay, so then to set up notation, I'll use this slash operator, okay, to denote uh, the modular transformation of weight W and so the modular forms of weight W will be invariant under such slash operators. And now, given the modular form or given actually any holomorphic function living on the upper half plane, uh, we can take the radial limit, namely you just approach a rational point from inside the upper half plane vertically, for instance. Then if you do this, it defines a function on the rationals. Okay, and this is exactly what's, uh, what's, uh, what I mentioned before between, but that gives us a relationship between the Q-series invariant and the WRT by taking this kind of radial limit. Okay, so if you have a modular form in particular, you can take this radial limit and then, then this radial limit then defines a function on the rationals. And the modular symmetry will be, will be inherited by this new function defined on the rationals so that this new function will also satisfy this equation. Okay, with a, an abuse of notation, I use the same uh, letter for the modular form for the function on the upper half plane and the uh, function defined on the rationals that I obtained by taking the radial limit. And I'll keep abusing uh, the notation in this way for the rest of the talk. So please interrupt me if something's not clear. Okay, so uh, to define quantum modular forms, you want to generalize this, okay? And uh, how do you want to generalize this? Uh, well, here I'm quoting uh, this paper by Don Zagir 10 years ago. He pointed out that the usual, two usual things that you require from classical modular forms, namely uh, analyticity and gamma covariance, none of this will be reasonable to require. Well, because the first thing analyticity, because I mean, your, your function is only defined on a rational. So how, how are you going to talk about analytic function? Okay, and gamma covariance is also stupid to require because you want something non-trivial, but SO2Z acts transitively. Okay, so you give up these conditions, but instead you can require that the failure of one property precisely offsets the failure of the other. Namely, although, although you start with a function defined on the rationals, but by taking this go cycle, this, this difference of between the function and its modular image, the resulting function has some property of continuity or analyticity, okay? But, um, and in the context of our talk, well, we actually often encounter something 
the quantum modular forms with more structure. So they're often referred to as the strong quantum modular forms. Namely, well, to each f, to f, to this function is defined on the rationals, but also attached to each rational point is an, you know, a power series. It could be most of the time divergent. But if you take uh, the modular difference, then you get something better, you know, like a, a value defined on the rationals on top of that, uh, a power series that's now uh, convergent, okay. So in, the co in our context, again, this will uh, be exactly what's responsible for the semi-classical one over K expansion of the WRT. So here we start to see why, you know, uh, our Q series invariants might need to have some quantum modular properties of this sort in order to get expected behavior on the, when we combine it into a WRT invariant. Okay, so in general, basic the basic ideas of quantum modular forms of Zagir is just that you have some function defined on some domain, and then such that the function uh, and taking the difference between the function and its modular image, you will get actually get some better function out of this. Okay, so that's the definition. Um, are there any sort of uh, examples? Well, yes. So for instance, some examples will be given by the Eichler integrals. There are two types of Eichler integrals that we'll need to talk about. One is holomorphic and the other is non-holomorphic. So um, as the name suggests, is this is some integrals of certain modular form. And uh, it is easy, well, at least not difficult to see why such isolated integrals are quantum modular forms. Well, because if we take this co-cycle, then uh, what we're left with is a period integral. Here I do the computation for you. So for instance, if W is, you know, in particular, like uh, uh, an integer that's larger than two, then you just get some polynomials in tau, which are of course analytic. Okay, so that's, that's uh, Eichler integrals. And an important uh, family of uh, examples are given by the so-called full theta functions. You take the familiar unary theta functions defined in this way. Okay, so basically just the theta function of way three half that's on the one dimensional lattice. Okay, and then you get the Eichler integral. Okay, I'll call it the tilde meaning denoting the holomorphic Eichler integral of something. So it's holomorphic Eichler integral is given by the so-called full theta function because uh, you just, instead of this k here, you just get the sine of k. So if you ignore the sine, then this is just the usual theta function, wait, one half theta function. So that's why this is called the full theta function. It's almost a theta function. Okay, so uh, now I'm done with this example. If there's no more question, I'll also talk about the mock modular forms, which also lead to quantum modular forms. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, Miranda, uh -huh. uh, yeah. just to make sure I understand the definition. So the yeah. quantum modular form itself, is, is it, a, the, are you viewing it as a function on Q or is it a modular form with that property of uh, the, 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 uh, right. the, I mean, right. so, um, is, yeah, so, you're calling the modular form. Yeah, so uh, I'm a being uh, sloppy in terms of, you know, uh, what I was calling an abuse of uh, notation mm -hmm. because uh, uh, I'm viewing uh, the function defined on the rationals 
to be my quantum modular forms. Uh -huh, yeah, so yeah. What, why, what do I mean by a false theta function is a quantum? What I mean is the false theta function leads to a quantum modular forms by taking, via taking the radial limit. Radial limit, I see, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the yeah. definition is set up so that that radial limit always exists because of this convergence property between, of the difference between the transforms or something, right? Yeah, in this case, yes. In this case, yes. In this case, yes. But uh, in the next case, namely the mock modular forms, then I have to be really careful because uh, I'm being uh, sloppy here in exactly the point that you have foreseen. But so let me explain this. Um, so what is a mock modular form according to Schwaefer's definition? Uh, it's a holomorphic function on the upper half plane. And uh, it's called a, 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 a mock modular form if there exists a modular form G, we'll call, the shadow, we'll call it the shadow of F of the dual weight, such that if we take, let's say the difference between this holomorphic function f and the non-holomorphic Eichler integral of g, then I get some other function on the upper half plane, I call the f hat. And f hat itself then transforms like a modular form. So f is hol holomorphic and not modular. And f hat is non-holomorphic and modular. So G is called the shadow because we can't see G from looking by just looking at the F, although even though G is you know crucial in defining F itself as a mock module form. So this is the usual definition of mock module form. So heuristically, we can also see why such a mock module form is a quantum module, leads to a quantum module form. Because the, the co-cycle coming from F is exactly that coming from the non-holoform morphic Eichler integral. Since the combination is, you know, transformed like a module form and hence has no co-cycle, okay, vanishing uh, co-cycle. And we already argued that this right hand side has uh, uh, analytic property. Okay, hence this uh, co-cycle coming from F must also have uh, analytic property. But we have to be careful with the point that uh, the radial limit of F does not always exist because there could be uh, exponential growth, exponentially growing terms when we take the radial limit. And in that case, what you have to do is to get, just discard the uh, exponentially growing term and then the rest still follows. That's not immediately manifest, but this is true. Oh, uh, maybe uh, if I have time, I'll say a bit later. Okay, and some simple uh, examples of mock module form, of course, it includes the module forms. And another famous example is the order seven uh, mock theta function of Ramanujan. Okay, so that's the background. And uh, yeah, no, well, no. yeah. Sorry. Sorry to bother you again, but I'm still no. a bit confused about this form. When you say it includes modular forms, right? Yeah. Does then, but uh, you you can't take the radial limit for any modular form, right? Uh, well, modular form, uh, if if it's completely homomorphic without any exponential growing terms, like mm -hmm. for so instance the yeah. data king eta function, I then see. you can. So you, but, you are assuming I mean, that it's holomorphic at the cusps then? No, but I mean, uh, if it's something like, for instance, the J function, then what you have to do is that you just really just to take off that exponentially growing term. 
and okay, then take the ra radio limit of the rest. And you can show that that doesn't change this fact. Oh, is that right, actually? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't change this fact. So it can be meromorphic at the cusps anyways, I guess. Right? Yes, yeah, it can have what's called the uh, immoderate growth or manageable growth or something like that. But yeah, exponential growth. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I need to speed up a little bit. Um, so let's take a simple example of plumbing graphs, just a three star. And then of course it has to again be de negative definite. And then what you get is the theorem that uh, all such, you know, all the Z hat invariants given by the definition I gave you in terms of theta function and so on, they are always uh, false theta functions of the type I gave you up to a finite polynomial that's most of the time zero. And this holds for all, you know, elements of Cochrane. So that's just uh, a fact. So we already proved, combining what we have heard uh, today, we already have proven that for such, you know, plumbing graphs, the Z hat invariants are examples of uh, quantum modular forms, although the sort of the super simple uh, manageable once the quantum module forms. Okay, so here's some, here's just uh, some examples of this conjecture that I talked about. An explicit example will be given by such a plumbing graph. It's so-called the Briscoe sphere with this simple form. And it's particularly nice because you know, you can actually show that the Z hat invariants up to some over a par. Q is actually the actually integral of the shadow of the order seven mock theta function. We'll come back to this later. And I also mentioned the, the relation to logarithmic uh, vertex algebras. So in this case, you can also prove that they are always, the Z hats invariants are always up to, you know, an eta function, always linear combinations of log VOA characters. So log VOAs, what are they? They're VOAs, and, but they're not uh, rational. They contain some modules that are not decomposable into ir irreducibles. And uh, in, well, hence they're pretty fun to study. So a very simple example will be the so-called one comma M algebra. Okay, you take some uh, a, a free boson and some particular uh, stress energy tensor that's given by this alpha zero, alpha zero is given by this you know, M in this way, and take the screening charge in this way that commutes with the stress tensor. And then you also consider the lattice VOA, okay, for one dimensional lattice, just lattice rescaled, Z rescaled by some number given by M. And then it has as its subalgebra the Heisenberg algebra, okay? And now you take the kernel of the screening charge on the lattice VOA, and then you get some uh, algebra, some logarithmic algebra, it's called the triplet one comma M algebra. And then you take the kernel on the Heisenberg and then you take the sub algebra that's called the singlet algebra. So coming back to the relation to Z hat up to this, you know, eta functions, what you actually get is that if you do the integral except for the central node, which clearly plays a distinctive role, then the um, the uh, the uh, remaining integrand, their linear combinations of triplets, uh, there's a T missing, excuse me, triplet one comma N characters. And once you take the contour integral, then you're just picking out the sort of the chargeless part, you're gauging this uh, extra U1, then you get the singlets characters. 
Okay. And that holds for all uh, three star graphs that are negative definite. Okay, so that's one example of the relation to, you know, between quantum module form and three manifolds. And we also see the hints of the log VOA coming. And then you might ask yourself why. I think the quantum modularity is quite natural from the point of view of relation to WRT. Although we don't know which is what is explaining what <laughs> at this point. And then um, hopefully we can uh, one understand the presence of log BOA via the 3D, you know, supersymmetric uh, field theory. And then uh, from the point of view of relation to between quantum module form and log VOA characters, you can think about this as some, you know, modification of Drew theorem for rational, B, rational VOA is that there are some still some hints of modularity remaining, even if you're thinking about logarithmic VOAs. Okay, so, uh, let me uh, talk about this part quickly. So there's a puzzle that's you know really shouting at us because we know that WRT has very simple transformation when we flip the orientation of the three manifolds. Namely, you then we just flip the sign of K. And we all know, we also know the dictionary between this Q variable or tau variable and the K between WRT and this Z hat invariant. So then we expect that uh, once we flip the orientation of the three manifolds, then that should give us some, you know, some, some tau to the min tau to minus tau transformation on the Z hat side. But I mean, what is this? Can we define such a thing? In order for such a thing to be well-defined, it seems like we need a function that's defined both in the upper as well as the lower um, half planes. So what is that? And uh, even worse, as I mentioned, when we talked about the definition of the hat, um, so if this M, once you flip the orientation, then this adjacency matrix no longer defines for you a negative definite space, then your theta function is ill-defined. So we don't have a, um, a definition for Z hat in that uh, case. Okay, but still, well, you can still play with examples and you know specific functions. So for instance, take this specific example, and we know that the Q series invariance is given by the Eichler integral of the shadow of the order seven Mach theta function of Ramanujan. And one very nice thing is that uh, this false theta function emits an expression as a Q hypergeometric series in this way. And then if you look at it, well, it, this, this Q hypergeometric series defines a function both inside and outside, but certainly not on the unit circle. As you can see, there's all kinds of very bad singularities uh, here. Okay, so what is this function outside the unit circle? Well, this in fact is nothing but the mock theta function itself. So that's very funny. So in other words, this Q hypergeometric series defines a function on, in, on the upper and lower half plane such that on one side you get the mock theta and on the other side you get the actually integral of its shadow. So if you're really bold, you just take this Q hypergeometric series as you know what really counts, then you conjecture that if you flip the orientation of this Briscorn sphere, 
then uh, the Q series invariance all of a sudden becomes the Ramanujan's order seven uh, mod theta function. So of course that's a little bit ad hoc because it depends on this coincidental existence. Well, to as far as I know, I, I can understand coincidental existence of a Q hypergeometric expression. But in fact, this is actually something more systematic. Well, Mach module forms can be represented as a Rademacher sum, which is a regularized sum over you know, images under, of some function under the action of the uh, module group. So a Rademacher sum defines a function, both upper and lower half plane. And on one, on the one side, which is a side we usually care about, it's the mock theta. And on the other side, it becomes the false, okay? So there's also a famous example of like very complicated way of writing zero. You can write a Rademacher sum such that on one side you get the eta function. On the other side, the eta function is modular. So the false theta function is zero. So then you obtain an extremely complicated way of writing zero on you know, one of the half planes. So this, is, this all goes through the hidden shadow of the mock theta. So if you're bold, then you're led to the conjecture that says that, you know, if on the one side, on the, let's say the good side where the adjacency matrix gives you a negative definite uh, space, if on this side, your definition gives you uh, the actual integral of some modular form, is a full theta function, then on the other side, when you flip the orientation, the conjecture, our conjecture says that then the mock module form, uh, the, the, the Q series invariant should be given by a mock module form, such that its shadow is given, exactly given by theta. Okay. So that's a little bit of wild conjecture because it has no hints of physics or topology so far. It's just only purely given, you know, made on the basis of this, you know, quantum modularity of things. So it's very nice to have an independent verification just for this, for the, for the conjecture, for this case of conjecture. Namely, I can represent this manifold as some surgery of a figure eight knot. Okay, and using the surgery formula that's uh, developed in the paper by Gupta Monolescu, a very nice paper, you can actually compute term by term this Q series invariance. And indeed, the Q series expansion or the order that we can observe uh, coincides with Ramanujan's uh, mock theta. Okay. That's very nice, but is there a way to obtain the answer uh, from a more direct definition? So I'm tempted to say yes by fixing this broken definition here. Well, because we know like uh, uh, there's actually, if you have a theta function with the wrong signature, there's actually a way to fix it by including a regularization factor and uh, Zweikers, well, following the old work of Vineva has actually studied this regularization factor. And um, it tells you that with uh, appropriate regularization, you actually get a well-defined function, which is moreover a mock module form. So we can fix the definition once we regularize the um, the theta function appropriately. And with this, you know, fixed definition, we can also obtain the right answer. So there's some hope that this is the, this mock form is the right way to go. Although a systematic understanding is um, still lacking here. Okay. So what we have seen is that, okay, uh, is is the cases um, 
of the conjecture that z hat invariants are quantum modular forms, which are no, in particular related to some vertex algebra in the case of um, SU2 theory and on the plot manifolds corresponds to you know, these three leg graphs, which are uh, cipher manifolds with three exceptional fibers. So you might worry that, you know, this is just a very limited thing. And actually um, it's, well, it's where we shouldn't be, uh, you know, deceiving ourselves just based on this limited uh, amount of checks. So um, in the new work, we will, yeah, find more examples uh, of the quantum modularity uh, properties in the, of the Z hats in different directions. And then as you will see, the, 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 the nature of the correspondence is actually also pretty interestingly different. So in one direction, well, let's uh, look at the simple one comma n logarithmic algebras. We can actually do, uh, generalize it um, to given any simply laced uh, systems. And uh, what do we do? Well, instead of one free bosons, so this case I described for you actually corresponds to just the A1 case. So in general, what you have to do is that you have, uh, R numbers of bosons to start with, where R is the rank of uh, G. And then you also change the uh, lattice VOA to be the lattice VOA given now not anymore uh, a one dimensional lattice, but the root lattice rescaled by, you know, again, the square root of M. And then the rest follows. So what you will get is the triplet and singlet, so-called higher rank, uh, one comma n logarithmic algebra. So for any D algebra G. Okay, so this is the work uh, starting with the paper by Boris Feiging and Tipunin. Um, and correspondingly, of course, the M uh, theory origin suggests that you have an ADE version of the Q series invariance for a given uh, three manifolds. Okay, so, um, and let me answer uh, an earlier question by Ming Hong. So, 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 now, before the, this A will be just given by the co-kernel of M. So now the, um, this A will be, of course, more general. It will be given by the discriminant group of the lattice, which is the lattice given by the adjacency matrix of M and uh, tensor the root lattice. That's um, the answer to this question. Okay, so if you uh, look at the higher rank version of the Z hat Q invariance, what you have, what you get to the is a completely analogous relation to the logarithmic uh, VOAs. Namely, if you integrate over all but the central node, then what you what, what you get as the remaining um, integrand is the triplets uh, higher rank version of the log VOA characters. And now uh, once you integrate it, you get of course the, the singlet log VOA characters. So hence they are still given by in a completely analogous fashion, the log VOA characters. And once, and you can also ask what, what if I uh, change my graph, okay? I can add one more legs, two more legs and so on. Uh, so an answer for, for instance, four legs graph, the graphs with four legs is that now uh, the log VOA will be replaced by the more general P comma P prime log VOA. Before we have 
P equals one, now they can be different from one and they will be different from one. So in this case, actually, you also have the corresponding minimal models that we all know and love. And um, so the log BOAs in this case will be, you know, bigger brother or sister of the minimal models if you want. Okay, but the corresponding also, correspondence between the Z hats for these manifolds and log BOAs also work so, uh, in analogous way. So that's the connection to the log VOA. How about the connection to quantum modular forms? Well, it's very interesting because you can see that, okay, this, when we, for instance, um, look at uh, the SU3 uh, theory, then the Z hats uh, invariant will actually be quantum module forms of the depth two, okay? So what's higher depths for the modular forms? Well, the definition works recursively. So the usual quantum module form that I defined earlier, they are the so-called depth one. So depth n means that, okay, you have a function such that uh, the co-cycle is now, is now a sum of quantum module forms of lower depths, okay? Then that's called depth n of depth less than m. So this, this is the recursive definition of higher depth quantum module form. So in the rank A2, you encounter depth two. So the uh, conjecture is that if you have, for instance, AN, then you encounter depth n uh, quantum module forms. But you know, it's technically not proven at this point. And uh, also, well, how about, you know, if you keep the group to be SU2, but then you change uh, the graph. So for instance, if you, uh, if you look at the four leg graphs, then uh, they are actually quantum module forms, uh, sums of quantum module forms of different weights. So that's also an interesting generalization of the cases we have seen before. So um, my time is uh, limited, so let me uh, wrap up here. So um, I think uh, it's an interesting phenomenon that uh, that are that that is being discovered here, and then there are on all fronts many open questions. Well, a short list of my personal favorites is that there are certainly examples for more families of three manifolds. For instance, I mentioned the paper by Google and Manolescu and the following work and uh, for um, not complements. And that's very interesting and still a lot to be explored. And then uh, we certainly need a better understanding of what's going on on the mock side. So what the VOAs there should, uh, should be uh, and why do we expect, you know, full theta function on one side and mock theta function on the other side because the level of complication seems to be quite different. And uh, we have seen uh, there are various different types of general quantum modular be behaviors and properties. And, uh, and I think we're only, the, this talk only covered, let's say the more, <laughs> the, the most simple ones, okay? The, the least exotic ones. And there are certainly a lot to explore there and I'm fascinated by these functions. And then, okay, so what does these properties say about the topology and physics? And can we derive these log VOAs um, from some first principles, even to have, you know, these vertex algebras themselves as uh, topological invariants? And uh, okay, so clearly this work has to be continued and I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, maybe I should preempt a few questions if it's okay. Uh, so, um, in this connection with VOAs, 
Mm-hmm. Log V O H. So if, uh, maybe I'm getting something confused, but there are well-known connections between some V O A's and uh, a, a topological invariants of three manifolds, right? Where the, you have this modular mm-hmm. categories. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, so, that's right. So your thing here is supposed to extend this in some way. No, 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 no. They it's they seem different. to be different. Mm-hmm. They seem to be different. We we don't see a relation between them. I guess if you look at, in fact, uh, the partition functions of the conformal field theories that give rise yeah. to the modular tensor carry categories that give you with aesthetic invariant, yeah. they yeah. don't have anything yeah. to do with the invariance, I guess, right? Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's some some different thing, new thing. <laughs> but these things that you get here are always log VOAs? Uh, uh, no, for instance, log VOAs are not known to give you mock module forms as, uh, as uh, characters. So for instance, if you flip the orientation, then you expect something else. You expect like maybe some super vertex algebras uh, that are not uh, the log VOAs we know of. No, but what I meant is, but what you get in this connection always have to be logarithmic? N- no. 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 Okay. So, for instance, no. For, so, for instance, from, yeah, on the mock side, we don't think like we, these are logarithmic mm-hmm. vertex algebras per se. I see. I mean, they have to be closely related. Like, there has to be just like, you know, at the level of, um, Quantum modular forms, you know, uh, once you get what you get from 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 one side, if you know the other side, so it should also work um, in this systematic way or mm-hmm. at the at the level of vertex algebras. But uh, we don't know the full answer yet. But uh, we don't expect per se that the other side also has to be logarithmic vertex algebras. Maybe I could add one more question, then I'll shut up. But it seemed like uh, what you did, if I understood earlier, if you look at the adjacency matrix, at the beginning it was negative definite, and in some sense you defined it for positive definite M, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then you, can you do this for in the, in intermediate signature? Right. So, for instance, uh, you can uh, you can relax the condition that you actually don't care about vert the 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 direction spanned by vertices, which are connected to only two or fewer uh, other vertex vertices. Mm-hmm. So you only care about the direction spanned by vertices that have at least three, you know, nodes connecting to it. So that can be relaxed. Uh-huh. I see. Yeah, so if you have like multiple, let's say this kind of central vertices, for instance, an H kind of graph, Mm -hmm. and one is positive, one is negative, then um, I haven't, we we don't have explicit examples yet, but from the theory of indefinite theta functions, mock module forms, those guys can, should one should also be able to deal with it using uh, Zweifer's idea of regularizing indefinite theta functions. Mm-hmm. I so I don't, uh, this, this, I don't see an uh, obstruction for intermediate cases, but uh, yeah, one should work harder and, and, and also work these cases out. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry, I've sort of asked too many questions, but no, 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 not the problem at all. I mean, it's, that's what that's what makes giving talks fun, right? Are there some other questions for Miranda? Oh, well, I guess if if not, um, it's a bit quite late on your side, right? It's uh. Something no, like it's it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, much worse. Uh, let's uh, uh, let's uh, maybe we can thank Miranda again and. Thank you very much. Thank you. Evening. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Bye.